remain standing as we read two foundational, maybe three, foundational scriptures from Proverbs 10, 22. Proverbs 10, verse 22. The blessing of the Lord makes one rich. And he has no sorrow with it. That's been a backdrop of the messages and the series I've been teaching, at least for the last, well, we can say month now. We've had a, we had, we, we interrupted or we had a um, pause in it for you Sunday. But this has been the backdrop of it. Proverbs 10, 22, the blessing of the Lord makes one rich and has no sorrow with it. First Samuel 2, verse 7 and 8, the Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and lifts up. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the beggar from the ash heap to set them among princes and make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he has set the world upon them. And then Psalms 113, verses 5 through 8, which is a parallel scripture to 1 Samuel 2, Psalms 113, 5 through 8. Who is like the Lord our God, who dwells on high, who humbles himself to behold the things that are in the heavens and in the earth? He raises the poor out of the dust and lifts the needy out of the ash heap, that he may set him with princes, with the princes of his people. May the Lord bless the reading of his word to his people. You may be seated. So we started this series a few weeks ago entitled Getting Rich God's Way. And the impetus for this message in this series is that I see today more than ever that people are, are trying, endeavoring, working, thinking about how to get rich. And to some degree, is nothing wrong with that. God wants us to believe for more. God wants us to strive for more. I took the first part, the first message to just let us understand that there's nothing wrong with being rich in and of itself. That we can do more for God and God can do more through us if we are rich. Y'all ever, y'all ever hear about something, you know, be something like Angelina Jolie or, 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 or um, um, What's the, any of those folks, any of the Hollywood elite, and, and they'll say something like, they raised $5 million for charity. Every time I hear that they raise, I'm like, what you raising it for? Why don't you just give it? What's all this raising about? You all ever see that? These people, and, and so the richer you are, you don't have to spend time raising. <laughs> you just give it and write the check. We can just give them right to check. So, so there's nothing wrong with being rich because we can save a lot of time. We have more rich folks. Amen. Things can happen quicker. So nothing wrong with being rich. That being money is not the root of all evil. It's the love of money that is the root of And the Bible says, which some covet after. Which some covet after. Meaning that becomes their number of desire in life to go after it. So we can do more for God. And God can do more through us if we are rich and money is not a issue or problem in our lives. And we establish that your deliverance from poverty is as much a part of the gospel of Jesus Christ as is healing and deliverance, as is uh, deliverance from sickness and, and as, is, as is healing of the broken heart and, and casting out demons. Your financial needs being met and you having more than enough is also part of the gospel. And so yet how we make money and how we get rich, it does matter to God. Because I get remind you of a statement from the hood, and that is all money ain't good money. Amen. So of course the Bible speaks of the wicked rich, of the wicked rich. He tells us, and it tells us regarding the wicked rich, don't compare yourself to them and don't envy them because they will soon be cut off. And so we started looking at how not to get rich. And the number one we say, number one we said to uh, way not to get rich is to not go by get-rich-quick schemes. I had to hear people making a spin on that, a uh, spin on that and say, well, well what you want to do? You want to get rich slow? If that's the will of God, then that's the way I'd rather do it. 
Okay, because you know, I, I, I heard somebody one time, we were, they were, we were they're in a, a marketing meeting. They were talking about, uh, well, wait, supposed to get rich slow? And then I heard somebody else say, who, someone who I really admired, but, and he started making fun of that, about that term, about people talking about get rich quick. But the Bible addresses get rich quick. And the Bible said when you hasten to be rich, you're not going to prosper. And you don't think about the poverty that's going to come upon you. So, no, we should not be trying to get rich quick. Because if you try to get rich quick, you don't think about how this is happening, how this is coming in, or what you're doing in order to make this happen. But the Bible tells us in Proverbs 28 and 20 that a faithful man will abound with blessing, but he who hastens to be rich or gets involved in get rich quick, quick schemes will not go unpunished. The New King James of Proverbs 28 and 2 says, a man with the evil eye hastens after riches and does not consider the poverty that will come upon him. So yes, we should not be trying to get rich through get rich quick schemes. Rather the versus being faithful and diligent in what God has called you to do and making sure that what you're doing is what's right before God. Secondly, we said you don't be greedy to get rich. Don't have an insatiable appetite for money and for things. Luke 12 and 15, Jesus says to the one who asked him to become a, a probate judge between he and his brother, he said, take heed and beware of covetousness because a man's life consists not in the abundance of things which he possesses. And, and I believe that, and I quote that, and I remember that, and I meditate on that, even though I had things. There's nothing wrong with having things as long as things don't have you. As long as you don't start estimating your self-worth based upon your things. And now you start looking down on people who don't have the things that you have. Do y'all realize there are things that you value that other people simply don't value? There's, there are some people who, are, who, who have multi-million dollar flow who would never buy a designer bag. They think, and they think the folks who buy designer bags are crazy. But if you follow them home, you see where the money's spent. You see where the money resides, where the money resides. I'm sorry, y'all. I don't know where that came from. I wrote a, I, I, I did a Google document recently, and I listed all, all my accounts and all the things where we are, and, I'm, and, I, and I don't know if she even seen it, and I shared it with, with my wife, uh, you know, and, and it's called Where the Money Resides, okay? Uh, but they, you follow them home, so just because somebody doesn't have the thing you have doesn't mean that they have any less than you have. You can't judge people by things. Again, some people want to wear all this stuff, Okay? <laughs> Then you might get ripped off at church. <laughs> so you can't be greedy. Thirdly, we said don't steal to get rich. Don't steal to get rich. I, that sounds basic. That sounds, uh, but Proverbs 6, 31, 32 said, we don't despise a person who steals to satisfy himself if he's hungry. He said, we understand you're hungry. Yet, when you're found, you got to restore. He said, now, yeah, we understand you was hungry, but you still got to pay. There's consequences for stealing. Amen? Ephesians 4, 28, let him that stole steal no more, but let him make restitution. Let him labor with his hands what things which is good that he may now have to give. Instead of being a taker, become a giver. That's a good right there. When God makes you rich, instead of being a taker, you should become a giver. You should be looking for opportunities to give. Number four, we said don't overwork to get rich. Proverbs 23 and 4 and 5 said labor not to be rich. The, the New King, excuse me, the New Living Translation of that verse makes that clearer. Proverbs 23 and 4, don't wear yourself out trying to get rich. Be not wise, uh, be wise enough to know when to quit. You work, in, you work in three jobs and can't come to church and you think everybody's supposed to commend you. Like everybody's supposed to, you, you, you proud of yourself having three jobs. We feel sorry for you. Amen. I believe God for everybody connected with right direction, you have a one and done. Amen. Amen. That means one job, okay, that supplies all your needs and you still got some more. 
and if you want to have some side flow be, through something you enjoy, there's nothing wrong with that. But you shouldn't be having to work two and three jobs just to pay your rent and pay your mortgage. Something got to change. And there's two ways to get rich. Here's another thing. Boy, uh, summarize my whole message. Two ways you can decrease your expenses or increase your income. Some of you, you don't have immediate control over increasing your income, but you do have control over decreasing your expenses. I saw someone on my, on my cable, on my, my cable bill, this uh, 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 email came. And it said, upgrade your cable, your cable now, your internet now, to a gig. For 19, uh, and I looked and said, well, you got 500, 600 now, you can get a gig. You can get a gig for, for $20 or more. And I upgraded it, and it said immediately it's gone through, and now I can't, now I can't get stations. Okay? I, I, I couldn't even watch my own broadcast this morning. It just wouldn't come through since I upgraded. And it, it, was a, it was something unnecessary. Sometimes we call ourselves upgrading, and it's just adding expenses. And I'm telling you, they really get you now, because you're talking about, well, I got, I got Paramount, I got Netflix, and, and it, one's only $9.99, and one's $19.99, and one's $5.99, and by the time you add it up, you, you, you're spending $250 for station that you don't even remember the password to. So sometimes we can just get richer by decreasing expenses. Don't overwork. Overwork, work, work, and, and really, I feel sorry for all you folks who always tell me you're working all the time. That's why you can't, you just, I say, wow, what a life. God gives us richly all things to enjoy. Laboring and working all the time just to pay expenses, something got to change. You need to make that a matter of prayer or make it a matter of choice. Overworking, toiling, working your finger to the bone to get rich is a byproduct of the curse. It's not the blessing. So Proverbs 10, tells us it's the blessing of the Lord. It makes rich. And it has no sorrow with it. The amplified of that verse, Proverbs 10, says, the blessing of the Lord, it makes truly rich. And it has no sorrow with it, neither does toiling increase it. The NIV of that verse says, the blessing of the Lord brings wealth without painful toil for it. And then the one they're not going to have is the God's word translation. That says, it is the Lord's blessings that makes a person rich and hard work adds nothing to it. It's God's blessings that make you rich. Come on, you, you know, you ought, to be, you ought to be happy for some stuff you got that you know you didn't work for, that you didn't pay for. It was a favor of God that arranged that. Glory to God. And see, I didn't always understand that. And back in the day, Jimmy and Tammy Baker, some of us know the story about what happened with them and where our Fort Mill campus is currently uh, having our services on Sunday afternoons at 4 o'clock. We're on the property that they, that they built back in, back in the days of Heritage USA and all that. And so we can't go in there and look at the pictures without reflecting on, on the grand days of Heritage USA and, and, and all that. But, but when, when the press and the media came after them, I was, I was a young man in my early 20s or maybe mid-20s because we were living in Maine. Um, and, and people found out that Tammy had fur coats and she had, and she had this. And, uh, and, 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 you know, some of y'all remember Tammy used to cry all the time. <laughs> She said, I didn't even, I, Jim didn't buy that. We didn't steal anything. Somebody gave me those coats. And the press was like, oh, stop it. Nobody gives you a fur coat. Those of us who walk in the favor of God know people can give you fur coats. People can give you cars. People can give you houses. Come on. People can give you money. And the world don't understand that because they overworking for everything. Oh, but the blessing of the Lord maketh rich. Yes, that's right. I didn't pay for this. God paid for it. God put me on somebody's mind. He raised up somebody somewhere, used their power, their ability, and their influence to bless me. Somebody say, I thank God for stuff that I didn't have to pay for. Oh, glory to God. Every Christian ought to be experiencing that. Every Christian ought to be able be experiencing that. Second Kings records someone who got off track in trying to get rich. 
So we've looked at at least four ways not to get rich. And some of this we see happening in this story in 2 Kings, starting in the fifth chapter, with this young man known as Gehazi. 2 Kings 5 and 20, let me give you the context. Most of us know the story. Naaman is a Syrian general. And the Bible says he was a great man, but he had leprosy. Leprosy. He was a great man, but he had leprosy. By him, Syria was delivered, but he had leprosy. The truth of the matter, all of us are great in various areas, and all of us got a butt. Okay? It's just a matter of where your butt is. I got, now some of y'all ain't going to do it, but I got to tell you, ask your name, where's your butt? <laughs> but don't even ask. And the truth of the matter, some of us butt is bigger than other people's butt. <laughs> What's wrong with y'all? Don't, don't lose the revelation with the illustration. <laughs> but we all got a butt. And, and, and Naaman's problem, his butt was he had leprosy. And his servant, a servant girl, I believe, I don't even think she was talking to him. She was talking about him. She said, would the God that my master was down there over there in Israel, they got a prophet over there. He could get healed of his leprosy, okay? And somebody goes and tells him, listen, there's a prophet over there. If you go see him, he can get you healed. And so he's finally convinced, and he goes and sees Elisha. He comes with a great train, he comes with money, he comes with clothing. He knocks on a door to see Elijah. And Gehazi, his servant, comes and says, hey, the, the general from, from Syria is here and he wants to see you. He said he wants to be healed of epilepsy. And Elijah didn't even come out the door. He didn't come and greet him. He said, oh, just go tell him to go dip seven times in the Jordan. And he came to be healed, but now he ends up getting in pride. And so he says, surely I thought he would come out and wave his handkerchief across the, or, and say, Shundai. <laughs> or something, he would, he would say something or scream or yell or wave his hand. He's just going to tell me to go dip in the Jordan. And if I was going to dip, I wouldn't dip in the Jordan anyway. i go back to Damascus. We got clean rivers over there. Why would I dip in this dirty Jordan? And some of us, the reason why you haven't been delivered yet, the reason why you've been healed yet, the reason why you haven't gotten money yet, the reason why you haven't been hired yet, is you won't dip. Dip means to humble yourself. Do something you don't see yourself doing. I heard someone recently, and, 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 and it's really hard for me to understand. Someone said, someone said I've been, I've been trying, I don't, for, for five years, I, I can't find a job. Five years. I, I can't, and I don't understand. I, I don't understand. Five years, you can't find a job. And the, the unemployment the, just came, rates just came out. We are 3.5% across the nation, lower than it's been in 50 years. Five years, you can't find, no, the problem is you won't dip. There's jobs out there, but some people won't dip. I was a, I, I was a young man, okay, uh, but, uh, ordained minister, uh, uh, had, had been in New Jersey working as a, child, as a child protective worker, you know, and, and in management and all these kind of things. I had done even in my, by the time I got in my early 20s and moved to Maine and out the will of God chasing money trying to get rich quick because it looked like a good move that could accelerate my life that I didn't pray about. Went to work for an uncle of mine and that didn't work out. And so I found myself unemployed. And, and then I found myself working on a, on, on, on a golf course. Okay? Not as a caddy. That would have been better. Okay? I had, never, I had never been on a golf course before. I grew up in the projects in Jersey City, New Jersey, and from the, from the project, from my window, there was a driving range. And I used to see people come over there all the time. I know now it's called a driving range. I thought that was golf. I had never seen greens. No, so I thought that was golf. It was just a driving range. Don't y'all laugh at me. Okay. I thought that was a driving range. And now I'm, on a, I'm on, at the Unum Open in Portland, Maine. Standing there, making about $5 an hour as a security guard with my degree. I had to dip. I just need, I needed some money, okay? 
and, uh, and my, my job, I'm, I think I was on the seventh hole to make sure that nobody, because it was along the street, that nobody run down from the street and attack a golfer or something. And I got to protect these PGA, uh, these PGA uh, professionals, these PGA celebrities. They better thank God nobody ran. They just would have been one attack PGA. I wasn't about to fight nobody. I ain't about to stop nobody either. <laughs> Not for five dollars an hour. I don't mean no harm. I would have I would have been like that brother sitting there who watched his pastor get ripped off with a million dollars. He said. They must have been paying him $5 an hour. I'm sorry, y'all. This ain't right. But I took that job because I had to dip. It wasn't what I wanted. I was overqualified for it. And the job that ended up be becoming a blessing in my life, becoming a claims adjuster, was again because I made a decision to dip. I took a temporary job. It's supposed to be a one-day assignment to go work for this. For, for, uh, I, now, I'm supposed to type out the insurance ID cards. This is around this is 1988. Maine had just went to voluntary liability insurance. So now everybody has to have an insurance ID card. They had never had that before. You know, didn't have on, surely we didn't have it on phones and all that kind of stuff. And my job was to type, and all day I just typed out, and they, they came to me at the end of the day. They said, all this got to be done over. I said, why? They said, because you made mistakes. I said, but I whited it out. I would write it out and type back. They said, no, these are legal documents. <laughs> you imagine you having had, 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 had the, had the, state, the, the state trooper a uh, copy of an insurance certificate that you didn't write it out and wrote some other number over it. And I said, listen, I said, I don't type that good. It, it, if, you need, if you need a good typist, they didn't tell me that. You need an accurate typist. I can type, but you didn't say accurate. And I said, I'm underqualified for this. And but just because I, and, and I took the job through Kelly Girl. It wasn't even Kelly, so I don't even know they still exist today. It was Kelly Girl. Now, what man goes and applies for a job to be placed by Kelly Girl? Somebody who's willing to dip. Amen. Oh, y'all aren't listening to me. Some of you, see, your next promotion is gonna take you're gonna have to take a dip. And I'm not necessarily always talking about taking a dip, always financially, but sometimes you have to humble yourself to do something you didn't see yourself doing. Oh, to serve an area you didn't see yourself serving. And through that, I met the manager. This is in Portland, Maine, and, and, this is, and uh, he, he, was, <laughs> he, he was ahead of his time. He was trying to, he was looking for diversity and inclusion. <laughs> And he said to me, he said, what do you, he said, do you have a degree? I said, yeah. He said, well, what do you do? I said, well, came up here, things didn't work out. He said, well, we're looking to hire claims of justice. Put in your resume. Okay, gave us a resume, and that job ended up becoming a 10-year career for me that ultimately brought me here to, to Columbia, South Carolina. But I had to be willing to dip. Are y'all listening to me? Some of you, your next promotion is going to require you to dip. Humble yourself. Stop, stop thinking of yourselves more highly, according to Romans 12 and 3, more highly than you ought to think. Are y'all listening to me? And so, Naaman at first wasn't willing to dip. And then his servant, another servant, thank God, thank God, Naaman at least listened to some people around him. Because the first thing he had to listen to someone around him to even come to over to Israel to, to meet the prophet. The second thing he had to do, he had to listen to one of his other subordinates and say, come on, master, if he asked you to do something great, wouldn't you do that? If he said you got to, if you killed a thousand men to be healed, would you? he said, all he asked you to do, just, come on, man, just dip. And he goes and he finally dips and he dips seven times and he comes up the seventh time and his skin is like a baby and all the leprosy is gone. And he's grateful. He goes back and knocks on the door and says, listen, you don't have to talk to me, but can I just give him, can I give him some stuff for helping me? Can I give him some money and some talents of gold and some bags of silver? Can I give him some chains of garment? And, and the man of God says, I don't need your money. Oh, my God. I don't need your, sometimes you got to know when it's time to receive, when it's not time to receive. 
God, oh, oh I'm jumping ahead of myself because I ain't going to get it. God wants you to be blessed enough that you can refuse some money. Oh, come on. Because all money ain't good money. God wants to be blessed. No, that's all right. But, but I, come on. I, I, I mean, right, 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 right now we got Saudi Arabia who's, who's, who's attracting all these, all these golfers to, to leave the PGA and work for them. And they're doing it with, with millions of dollars. I think they offered recent Tiger Woods like seven or eight hundred million. And, and Tiger, Tiger Woods said, no, nah, that's all right. I'm good. Come on, it's good to be able to make decisions and money not being the driver of it that you got some bigger goal, some bigger values beyond money, and you live at a place that I can't be bought. Oh, come on now. And so Elijah says, no, thank you. I'm good. And so now we pick up here 2 Kings 5 and 20. But Gehazi, the man of God's servant, Gehazi said, the, the servant of Elijah, the man of God said, look, my master has spared Naaman, this Syrian, while not receiving from his hands what he has brought, but as the Lord lives, I'm going to run after him, and I'm going to take something from him. Let me give you a modern translation of as the Lord lives. I swear to God, <laughs> if it's the last thing I do, I'm going to get me something. Now, he don't have to take something, but I'm going to take something. This looked like a good opportunity. I'm close enough to get rich. Ah, uh, you don't catch that. I'm close enough to take advantage of this opportunity to enrich myself. And so the first thing that he did wrong to get rich, he started coveting. What Jesus said, don't do. A man's life consists not in the abundance of things that he, uh, he started coveting, which came from discontentment. Discontentment means I can't be satisfied where I am. I can't be around all this without this driving me crazy. Every time I see your car, it reminds me that I don't have that car. Every time I see your ministry, it reminds me my ministry ain't that big. Every time I hear your voice, I start asking me, thinking my voice better than yours. And how come I, I ain't had those those doors open to me and you start comparing yourself because of discontentment and everybody can't handle being around blessed people those of you God starts blessing watch who you hire watch who you have close to you everybody can't handle your blessings some people it will mess them up and drive them crazy Oh, I had no idea he got that. I had no idea she received that. I had no idea people do those kind of things. For I had no idea they can go in those kind of rooms. It was a, I had an occasion, the first time, the first time I had lunch with Bishop Jakes, Pastor Marshall and I, we were invited to, it was after Women Without Loose, and somebody looked across the room, I saw him pointing at us, and they sent me a text, they said, Bishop Jakes wants to have lunch with you, you and, you and Pastor Marsha. I said, okay, and so, so we, at first I wasn't going because I had jeans on, you know, and I was looking kind of real casual. Pastor Marcel said, oh, we going. <laughs> we going, jeans and all. And so I figured there going to be a whole bunch of people there. And there wasn't a whole bunch of people there. And so I, I, I figured it, it was going to be a bunch of people there. And so, we, and so, and so they texted me, are you coming? I'm like, yeah, I'm coming. I mean, there's probably 100 people in the room. How are you missing us? And we get there, Bishop Lady Jakes, someone connected with somebody, somebody else quite notable, and their assistant. The assistant didn't know to shut up. It was five of us in the room. And the assistant said, can I, Lady Jakes, can, can I take a picture? Can I? And so she said, we, we, baby, we'll take pictures later. Everybody can't go in the same room you go in. Everybody can't handle your access, hand, handle your favor. My son Chandler got ready to do something recently for somebody. I said, no, no. I said, you got to manage that favor. I said, just because just you got the favor to do that, that one, that's all on that mean you give that to somebody else because they've given that to you. Just because you got somebody's cell number don't mean you share that with everybody. You got to know how to manage favor. <laughs> Brother West, it, it just occurred to me, it just occurred to me why, why so many people end up changing their phone numbers. I used to think they were just being bougie. They give you a phone number and then all of a sudden you don't have it. You know, like, wait, you just gave me, no, because somebody shared it wasn't supposed to share it. 
But I learned something else for several years ago from Bishop Ivy Hilliard. I was around, Bishop Ivy Hilliard gave me his number. We were talking. I said, well, Bishop, I'm not going to harass you. I'm not going to harass you. I won't be calling you all the time. He said, oh, you can't harass me. I said, well, I just want to, I won't be calling you. I'm going to try to, he said, you can't harass me. He said, I got your name saved. He said, if I don't want to talk to you, I don't want to answer. <laughs> I said, now that's a whole different philosophy. <laughs> you can't harass me. So he, the, he started coveting. He said, the Lord, my, my master spared Naaman, but I'm going to get me something. As the Lord lives, I swear to God, I'm going to run out there and I'm going to take something from him. So he goes after, and now he conjures up this story. He said, excuse me there, uh, General, General Naaman. Right after you left, some other prophets came to visit my prophet. And he didn't need anything, but he sure could. He asked me if I can come. Can you give them a couple of bags of silver and gold and and they could use a few, uh, a few of those changes of garments that you want to give him. Pick up here in verse 22, and he said, and, and so Naaman sees him, 2 Kings 5, 22, he says, is all well? He said, oh yeah, my master sent me. That's a lie, right? Say, indeed, just now, two young men of the sons of the prophet, they've come from the mountains of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver oh, and two changes of garment. So, so now, now, first he started off coveting to be rich. Now he's lying to get rich. Are y'all listening to me? Then the, the third thing, so he said, oh, no, be content. Don't, don't just take one bag. Take, take, take two bags. And he takes them and he goes and hides them. That's what I said during all of it. Now he goes and hides them. If you got to hide it, you didn't get it right. Whether it's a car, a piece of jewelry, or, or, or your special wig. <laughs> Take the hat off. Don't hide it. As they say, if you pay for it, it's yours. Amen? And so now he's, he hides it in the house. He, he started off coveting, then lying, and now he, he hides it. 2 Kings 5, 24, and when he came into the city, he took them from their hand. Oh, whoa, 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 let, let, let me back up. Not only that, let's, let's back up, because this is an important point that the Lord showed me. Hey, a lot of people missed this. Not only did he get it from him, he had Naaman's, he had, he, he had Naaman's servants serving him. He had them carrying this stuff. He's supposed to be the adjective, but now he got an adjective. He's supposed to be the assistant. Now he had, oh, he's feeling good right over here. Put it over there. Okay? Sometimes you got to stay in the posture you're supposed to stay in while you're there. Let God, don't, don't, no, no, I'm here to serve. I, I, this ain't about me right now. Well, well, what do you do? It's not even important what I do. I serve. That's what I do. I said, I said to, to a friend of mine one time who, 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 would, who would bring his assistant, the adjutant, with him. And the adjutant come to me and said, Bishop Betty, if you ever need somebody to come preach for you, I, I'm always here. I, I, said, I said, you out of order. I said, you ain't even, you ain't even, I ain't supposed to know you preach. Oh, y'all don't like me now. I said, I ain't supposed to know you preach. All I know you do is serve. And I said to that pastor, I said, you need to understand. I said, your, your assistant here um, is trying to get preaching appointments while he's at your preaching appointment. Oh, come, y'all don't like me now. So you got to stay in the right posture. Let God open up the doors he wants to open up for you. So he, he is a servant serving him. He goes in the house and he hides it. And when he came to it, he took them from the hand and stored them away in the house. And then he let the men go. Now, Gehazi, y'all need to understand, Gehazi was in a position to be enriched. He was in a position to be blessed beyond what he could lie, chill, cheat, or steal to get. He was in that position. He was on the right track. That he wouldn't have to lie. He wouldn't have to cheat. He wouldn't have to get out of position. And he wouldn't have to steal. So now he comes back. After being gone for I don't know how long. He comes back. And Elisha said, where were you? And the reason why I call him a young man, the Bible don't give us his age. But he had to be 15 or 16. 
Because this is a classic 15 or 16 year old response when their parents asked them where they've been and they've been somewhere they're supposed to be. He said, where you been? He said, nowhere. <laughs> he had to be 15, 16. If you haven't been here, you've been somewhere. You haven't been in church in a year. Where you been? Nowhere. No, you've been somewhere. Mexico, Puerto Rico, at the house. You've been somewhere. You haven't been here. And he lies to the man of God. Now, uh, y'all know, once you tell one lie, you got to tell another one. And then they, then they get more compounded like a snowball. And then you get to the point that you can't keep up with your lies. And then when you can't keep up with your lies, either somebody's going to say, well, that ain't what you said last time. Oh, no, but you told so-and-so. No, well, no, you told me somebody gave you that. No, you told me you found it. No, you told me, uh, uh, okay, now the lies start unraveling. Can I tell you, some people live a whole life of lies. At some point, it's going to start unraveling. Be sure your sin's going to find you out. And so now he comes back to the man of God, 2 Kings 5, 26 and 27. Then he said to him, did not, you say you, you, you didn't go anywhere. Did not my heart go with you when the man turned back from the chariot to meet you? He said, I watched the whole thing happen. Y'all need to understand. He said, the Lord showed me a movie. Now, some of y'all don't know nothing about this. I don't really know nothing about this, but I live with a woman who does. I've been married for 37 years. I ain't never been with another woman. And I would love to say it because I'm so holy. But part of it is I've never been another woman because I got a wife who lost your movies. <laughs> That'll keep you straight. <laughs> in like the first two years I'm married, I got myself in a situation and something bad could have happened. Okay? Found myself in a situation for this woman who kept assuming, and she I said, I'm married. And she said, I'm not interested in your wife. I'm interested in you. That was bold, y'all. I had never heard that before. I, you know, I figured, where my bling ring? I, I, I'm married. She said, I'm not interested in your wife, nor your ring. I'm interested in you. I almost got myself in a situation. And Martha said, where you been? I said, there ain't nowhere. I was about 15, 16. <laughs> she said, no. I said, no way. She said, no, the Lord showed me the whole thing. My eyes went. <laughs> I mean, gave me the, I said, oh, Jesus. That'll keep you straight. That's why I told you, that's my second Holy Ghost right there. Okay? The Lord showed Elisha, the whole thing, he said, did not my heart go with you when the man turned back from his chariot to meet you? And look what, I, I, I put this in our talents because I want you to see this. He said, is it time to receive money and to receive clothing and to receive olive groves and vineyards and sheep and oxen and male and female servants? Therefore, because you were in a Rush to get rich. And you wouldn't do it God's way. The curse is going to come on you. The, therefore the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and your descendants forever. Now we know a righteous man, his blessing can be on his children. And his children's children. In this case, he says going be, the leprosy of, your, uh, of, of Naaman is going to be on you and your descendants forever. And he went out from his presence leprous as white as snow. So watch this, y'all. Uh, Gehazi's conniving and stealing connected him to the curse. But I got to take some time to back up and show you this. But his continued serving in the right posture would have connected him to the blessing. He was on track. He was on track to, ha to have all this stuff. He was on track to be the person who would be offered these things and have the opportunity to refuse it. 
Watch this, Matthew 10, 14, excuse me, Matthew 10, 41, reminds us this. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. The reward that will come to the prophet, if you stay in the right posture towards the prophet, towards that ministry gift, towards your pastor, towards your bishop, towards your, towards your leader, towards your parents, he receives a prophet in the name of the prophet, will receive a prophet's reward. He receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man, shall receive a righteous man's reward. The message translates to that verse says, accepting a messenger of God is as good as being God's messenger. Ex watch this, accepting a messenger of God is as good as being God's messenger. He said, now you're coveting, you're, you're, accept, you're coveting being the messenger and you just need to accept the fact that God got you serving the one with the message. And if you just serve the one with the message, God will bless you just like you were the one who was the messenger. Oh, come on now. And so many people don't see this and they miss it and they get off track. And I got to remind you, because some of you are where you are right now because you stayed in a right posture of service. And now you got to the place that you're too big to serve. You're too busy to serve. You are where you are right now because God set you up through service. And now you're too busy to serve. God set up your marriage through this ministry. God gave you children through this ministry. God opened up doors through this ministry. And now you're too big and too busy to serve in the ministry that hooked up your life. I go back to Jersey City, the church I came out of. And a friend of mine came here, the musician. He came here and saw our ministry, the magnitude of our ministry. Shortly after that, I was back in Jersey City, preaching a three-night conference. Less than 50 people there every night. He said to me, Herb, why you come back here? I mean, you don't have to do this. Why do you come back here? Because I can't forget where I came from. I can't forget if I, was, if I wouldn't be on this stage if I didn't first serve on that stage. Oh, come on. I, 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 can't, I, I can't forget the fact that I was faithful when nobody knew my name. And I can't forget the root that produced the fruit. Are oh, y'all listening to me? And so I stay in that same posture. I was an adjutant before I knew the word adjutant. I was a PPA, pastor personal aide, pastor personal assistant, before I knew, as, as, as a young man, my bishop used to go out and preach, and me, me, me and this other guy, we was always, he was always trying to get my uncle's briefcase, and I'm taking it from him. I got it. And so we grabbed the briefcase, and we, 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 we walked up the aisle, found him to change his clothes. Give me that. Give me that. Give me that. I got it. This is my uncle. Help him to, and Bishop Bailey, when he preached, he preached through all his clothes. I mean, sweat like three pigs. Okay, change, had to, and so it changed the clothes, hang his clothes up, get, get plastic bag, put the wet clothes in, wipe them down. I did all, the, I was doing all that at 12 and 13 and 14 and 15, just serving, just serving, just serving. Didn't, didn't know what, nobody saw me, didn't have a title, didn't sit on the platform with him. As, as an adjective, just serving. But I look back at all that and said, that produced this. I was angry about it at the time, but, but my, my former pastor, one who launched us into pastoral ministry, we got a house that literally was around the corner from his house. We could walk to his house, and, and we shouldn't have done that because he would come over all the time whenever he needed help. He's in seminary at Oral Roberts University. He found that I could write well. And he would get stuck, have brain freezes and brain writing block at one o'clock in the morning for a paper that's due the next morning. And he would call me up and say, uh, what you doing? <laughs> well, most people doing at one o'clock in the morning who got a job. Listen, I need you to help me with this paper. It, it won't take long come over the house and I sit there writing the paper. He would talk and I would write it. That's why to this day, I, I, I'll still tell, I'll say it boldly. If he, he got the master in divinity, he may got the master, I got the divinity. 
and, and I, I would help him write his papers. And it would, sometimes it was supposed to take an hour, but it ended up taking three and four hours. He would ask me to take a, you know, stop me during the day and do it. And I look back, and sometimes sometime I don't always have the right attitude about it, but I knew, watch it, I never, we never said no. Am I right, honey? We never said no. And because of that, I'm here today. I look at that. I look at that, those years of serving. That's why people look at my ministry and look at me, eh, just came to South Carolina and that ministry just came up from nowhere. They don't know those years of service when nobody knew my name, when I wasn't being paid a dime. Jehazah, keep the right attitude. You're on your way. God's going to make you rich. Don't lie for it. Don't steal for it. Don't get out of position for it. Colossians 3 23 and 24 talks us the blessing of serving. Whatever you do, do it heartedly. As to the Lord, not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. You serve a man, but don't do it like it's just for man. Knowing that from the Lord you receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Jesus. It's the blessing that maketh rich. So I'm serving man, but the blessing comes from God. You, you got to catch this. And the blessing going to make me rich. And one of the ways I get the blessing is by serving. It's by being faithful. So what did Elisha ask Gehazi? 2 Kings 5 and 26. He asked him a question. Is it time to receive money, to receive clothing, and olive groves, and vineyards, and sheep, and oxen, male, and female servants. Now, if I was Gehazi, I'd say, now hold up now. I know you've seen your movie and everything. I know you think the Lord showed you, but you must have something wrong. Because I didn't get no satisfaction. I'm sorry, no. <laughs> I didn't get any. Sheep and oxen, olive groves and vineyards. Now, I may have got some money. I got some clothes. But I didn't get any olive groves and vineyards and sheep and oxen. And I had some male servants who carried those things, but I didn't get no female servants. And what he didn't realize is that the man of God was not just seeing the present. The man of God was seeing his future. He said, if you would have stayed in the right position, God had more for you than just a little bit of bag of money and a couple of chains of clothes. God was going to bless you with olive groves and vineyards and sheep and oxen and male and female servants. But you got to wait on the Lord. Watch this. Is it time to receive money and receive clothing? olive groves and vineyards and sheep and oxen, male and female servants. Is it time, if he stayed in the right posture, those first two words would have been inverted. And it would have got to the time where it, he would have said, it is time to receive money <laughs> and clothing and olive groves, and vineyard, and sheep, and oxen, male and female. So remember, it's the blessing that makes rich. There's a blessing that comes from serving in ministry. Elisha knew about this because he had faithfully served his spiritual father, Elijah. And he had received, oh, come on, stay with me here. I'm just about done, but you got, got to connect it. And he had received the blessing that maketh rich. He had received the double portion of Elijah's anointing. Now somebody said, now what this got to do with being rich and having money? Well, let's, let's, let's follow it out. That blessing that was on Elisha's house, or in Elisha's life, that made him rich, connected him. Because he got the double portion through serving. Even when the man of God said, leave, I'm about to die. He said, I'm going to be with you. I don't care what you go through. I'll go with you Jericho. I'll go with you through, I'll, I'll, I'll go with you Gilgal. I'll go with you through, through the Jordan. I'll go wherever you go. I'm going to stay with you because God told me not to leave you. Through all your ups and downs. 
through your emotional insecurities. That's what Elijah went to. The same man who called down fire was crying, saying, this woman going to kill me. And the servant had to be with him through all that. The servant had to be able to see Elisha had to be able to see Elijah's butt. He's a great man of God, but he gets scared every now and then. He's a great man of God, but he gets insecure. He's a great man of God, but he, he cries and has these emotional downs. Elisha knew about this because he had faithfully served Elijah and had received the double portion. The double portion manifested the blessing that maketh rich on his life. That blessing on his life that makes rich connected him to a rich and influential woman. Connect the dots. And her husband, who whenever he would come down in that area, he didn't have to worry about where am I going to eat? Where am I going to get a meal from? That woman fed him every time he was in the area. And then she got to know him. First, she was just honoring him as a man of God, honoring him for the position. But as she got to know him more intimately, she says to her husband, I perceive that this is a holy man of God. Which tells us that there's men of God and then there's holy men of God. I don't just want to be a man of God. I want to be known as a holy man of God. And you're not holy just because you say it. You're holy because somebody else notices it. This woman noticed. This is a holy man of God that passed by continually. And she says to her husband, let's build a room onto our house. This wasn't about turning, I didn't mean your home, turning a, turning a single wire into a double wire. This is a major construction undertaking. These houses were built out of stone, sometimes in the size of mountains. And let's build a room onto our house. The, one translation says she was a rich and influential woman and a husband. By the time Naaman came along and offered clothing and money to Elisha, he knew and had manifestation of the blessing that makes rich and has no sorrow that I don't have to compromise with you for money. He had learned to trust God for his money that I know the difference between good money and bad money. He, had, he was blessed enough to be able to refuse where his money going to come from. Pick, choose, and refuse. When you have the blessing on your life, the blessing that maketh rich and have no sorrow, you know that you can trust God to make you rich. You can take him at his word and you don't compromise or take shortcuts to get rich. Are y'all with me here? That's what we saw happen as I get very close here. That's what, what, what we saw happen with Abraham. In Genesis 12, we all know the story. God speaks to Abraham, calls him out from Ur of the Chaldees and says, I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to bless you, I'm going to make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. You're going to be blessed spiritually, you're going to be blessed financially, you're going to be blessed materially, and I'm going to make you a blessing. Everybody's going to know your name. I'm going to put your name in the wind. Oh my God, are y'all listening to me here? He said, I'm going to make those, I will bless those who bless you, I'm going to curse those who curse you, and you all families of the earth shall be blessed. And so God started manifesting that. And whenever God has you on a track to make you wealthy and to get rich God's way, the devil will always come in and try to get you off track. He'll try to get you to take a shortcut, take a detour. You could do it quicker this way. You know, people make money quicker if you do this instead of that. You know, you could charge, you could do this, you could charge this much, you could, you, you're going to do all that and just give that for free? And whenever God has you on the track, you know, many times the devil will bring opportunities to get you off track. So Genesis 24, uh, G Genesis 14, two chapters later, Abraham's on track. God, God's blessing, God's making his name great. And now he's increased enough to have his own army. 300 people raised in his own house who he trained. Are oh, y'all listening? He got servants. He got employees. 300 men who went after Lot and his wife and his family to get them back. And when he defeated these nations to bring Lot back, the king of Sodom, Genesis 14, met him and said, let's make a deal. I can make you rich. 
And look what Abraham says. Genesis 14, verse 22. Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord, God most high, the possessor of heaven and earth. And I made a vow to the Lord. I have literally sworn to God that I will take nothing from a thread to a sandal strap. And that I will not take anything that is yours, lest you say, I've made Abraham rich. He said, I'm on a path <laughs> that nobody's going to get glory for this but God. Ah, my God. God is blessing the work of my hands. He's increasing me more and more. And the more I dig, the more brass I'm finding. And I'm not going to get off the track that God has me on just because you come and bring me another alternative that look like it can happen quicker. I'm not going to compromise. No, I'm not marrying somebody just for money. No, I'm not taking this job just for money. No, I'm not leaving the place of my provision, my Jehovah Jireh, and moving to another city because everybody else is there when God told me to be there. Are y'all listening to me this morning? So he says, I'm not going to give you the opportunity to say you made me rich. I'm going to stay on God's path for my life. I'm going to keep walking with God. I'm going to keep on tithing. I'm going to keep on giving. I'm going to keep on being faithful to God. And the blessing that make of the Lord that maketh rich and had of no sorrow was manifest in Abraham's life. Because Abraham trusted God, walked with God, and waited on God, we see the culmination of the blessing in Genesis 24 and 1. Genesis 24 and 1, it says this. Now, when Abraham was old, and well advanced in years, the Lord had blessed Abraham in some things. Oh, my God. Somebody need to get excited. Say, God, give me, bless me in all things. Some of y'all just thinking about a car. God said, I want to bless you in all things. Some of some, some you just trying to get a house. God said, I want to bless you in all things. Some, some of you, your dream, your dream is to have a, a black American Express card, which you got to spend something like $500,000 a year. Who want that much debt to keep paying off for some status? God, God said, I want to bless you in all things. You're trying to get a bag. God said, I want to bless you in all things. I want the blessing to be on your life, not just on your pocketbook, not just on your car, not just on your house. I want the blessing to be on your life, that everywhere you go, you're blessed in the city, you're blessed in the field, blessed when you come, blessed when you go. Somebody say, I want my life blessed, 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 I want my life blessed. I used to envy, I used to envy when I was a young man, younger man. <laughs> when I was a young man, I said, look on, on, C, on CNN, um, on, um, um, thank you, TBN. I said, look on TBN, look at those interviews. And Paul and Jan Crabb said, they're going to be interviewing me one day. I'm, I'm going to be sitting here, supposed to be having a conversation one day and start preaching too. Y'all don't like me. <laughs> so I can try to get an appointment at the next conference. Y'all don't like me now. Y'all don't like me. But I'll be talking, well, 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 where'd you grow up? Well, where I grew up? I grew up in Jersey, said <laughs> in New Jersey. But the Lord blessed me in a project. I thought we just had a conversation. Anyway. <laughs> I used to think I want to be on TBN. And I want to rub elbows with this preacher and rub elbows with that preacher. And as God blessed me and gave me more exposure, I got to know a lot of these people who I thought I wanted to be around. I got to be around these people who I thought I was envying their lives. And I realized, I said, God, thank you for blessing my life. I got a wife who loved me for real, don't you? Wait, make sure everybody see you. What'd you say? Yeah, okay. Hey. I got a marriage that's just not a ministry marriage. I have children who actually respect me. I have children who are proud to tell people that I'm their father. Y'all listen to me. 
I'm able to see my grandchildren. And I started looking. I said, oh, they got a car, but their life ain't blessed. They got big stages, but their life's not blessed. They got big platforms, but their life is not blessed. And so now I look at my and say, God, thank you for blessing my life. I don't ever have to be on TBN. And I've been on TBN and I paid for it. I used to, you know, I got friends. I, I preach in Africa three times. And every time I've been preaching in Africa, I've paid to go. And, I, and my friends, oh, Herb, will you? Man, I ain't going nowhere, man. They're going to give me my ticket. I paid to go. And I look back. I said, God, thank you. I was able to pay to go. Watch this. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that I was able to go to an impoverished place and not make them more impoverished. I was preaching in Nigeria, and I was preaching about prosperity, how God would bless them. And the money rush happened. And people start bringing me all this money. And we pre- every time I preach, they brought me all this money. Narrow. They call it narrow. I don't know why they call it narrow. You can't get near nothing with it. I don't know where that came from. At least back then, n- narrow. You can't get near, near nothing with it. And you can't get it out the country. Anyway, and so I saw the bishop. I saw the bishop kind of looking at me. And so I, I, they would give it to me, and every night I took it back to our room. The room that I had to pray I wouldn't be bitten by anything because Pastor Marsh had heard that somebody else had went and stayed in the same room, and she took all the covers and wrapped herself up like a mummy and left me completely exposed to the elements, to the bugs, to the spiders, and she's just sitting there. I said, honey, she said, no. I'm totally exposed. And she's wrapped up like a mummy because she didn't have, have nobody, nothing bite her because this person said somebody went there and they described the place and, and they, 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 had a, they had a perpetual limp. She said, the devil is a liar. <laughs> and the last day of that meeting, before we left, I went and took all that money, I don't know how much it was, and gave it to that bishop. And I said, I want you to take this and bless your life and bless your ministry, whatever. I didn't need to take anything out the country. The blessing of the Lord maketh rich allows you to say no. I never thought about that to just this moment. I'm blessed enough that I can go and preach the gospel. Oh, my God, like Paul said, without charge. Let me finish this, y'all, for real, for real, for real. Go to Genesis 24, and I'm done. And I told you, you're not blessed the way God wants you to be blessed until somebody else can see how blessed you are. Somebody else can tell your testimony for you. Genesis 24, Abraham sends his servant, who believed to be Eliezer of Damascus. He sends him to go find a wife. For his son Isaac. And he sends him, he says, Now, Lord, bless me that I bring back the right woman and connect me with the right people, put favor upon my trip. And when he gets there, because he has to convince somebody to come back to be the wife to his servant, to his master's son, he didn't take Isaac with him. Because sometimes the kids don't know how to choose right. And so he sends him with the blessing. Genesis 24, 34 and 35. When he comes and he sees, what was it, Rebecca? He sees her and meets her father. He said, let me tell you who I am. Genesis 24, 34. And he said, I am Abraham's servant. The Lord has blessed my master greatly. He has the blessing upon his life that maketh rich and addeth no sorrow. And he has become great. Everybody say become, become. Didn't happen all at one time. It was a process. He's become great with me. He's become wealthy and rich. And God has given him flocks 
and herds and silver and gold, male and female servants, camels and donkeys. God did just what he said he would do for Abraham. And yet he turned down opportunities. God did what he said he would do for Elijah and Elisha. And he would have done the same thing for Gehazi. But we have to understand that what you want to tap into is the blessing. The blessing. And let me tell you something else. Mm. Hear me about the spirit of God. Your offense can disconnect you from the blessing. I won't go into too much details about this. But I watched somebody one time who I knew the Lord divinely connected our lives together. And God was blessing them. And I saw the offense come upon them. And I saw the offense and I tried to talk to him. I said, do not connect, do not disconnect yourself from, I think I meant, the words I may have said is the source of your blessing. But what I meant was your blessing connection. He didn't listen to me, got offended, and his whole life unraveled. I watched his whole life unravel. Offense will disconnect you from the blessing. And sometimes you got to do what I call kizzy. Y'all, any of us remember Roots? After Kunta Kinte, who they gave him the name Toby, got his foot cut off because he kept running trying to get free. He didn't want that to happen to his daughter, so he named her Kizzy. And his name with Kizzy meant stay put. Stay put. Sometimes you got to Kizzy. You got to stay put even though it's uncomfortable. You got to stay put even though it doesn't seem like it's happening as quickly as you want it to happen. You got to stay put when other people are leaving. You got to love the one you're with. When everybody else is getting divorced and remarried and you can't even keep up. And which wife is this? this? And y'all, all this stuff is happening in the body of Christ. I know we don't hear anything about it. We don't want to say anything about it because, 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 because. Yeah. But y'all, God has a blessing. He wants to be in our life. And it'll make you rich. It won't ever add any sorrow with it. And you don't have to apologize for it, but you also won't be able to explain it. All you know is, I just did what God told me to do. I stayed where he told me to stay. I lived as he told me to live. I gave as he told me to give. To, to give. I forgave as he told me to forgive. Something happened recently in our family, and I found myself being in unforgiveness. And I had to honestly say, I said, I ain't forgave that person. And the Lord said, well, what are we going to do about that? Because that's a choice. And the person don't know nothing about my unforgiveness. So I remember just stopping. I said, Lord, by act of, I start right where I was. By act of my will, I forgive this person and I release this in Jesus' name. And I thank you, Lord, that the love of God that has been shed abroad in my heart by the Holy Ghost is rising up in my heart for this person. I had to make a choice. You know why? Because I know unforgiveness can hinder this blessing that's on my life. And sometimes, well, I, I, what happened? You in offense. And your offense is a blessing blocker. Your unforgiveness is a blessing blocker. You seen that person every time you see me rolling your eyes? That's a blessing blocker. You got too much on the line. You still got too much debt to get out of. You still got children's college education to pay for. You still want to live a long life and still have your right mind. It's statistically proven. That many times older people deal with Alzheimer's, they were bitter people. They were angry people. They were unforgiving people. They were people who had a lot of issues with everybody. 
And I've been around it. I've seen it. I said, God, I don't want any of that on my life. I've been thinking of a, I ain't even nowhere there yet. But, but, but when I'm 85, I'm going to preach that message from Caleb said, I'm this day, 85, give me this mountain. And y'all remind me that I'm going to preach this message when I'm 85. And the message called, I still got it. <laughs> Caleb said, I still got it. And God wants you to still have it. Even as you get older, he wants you to still have it. Still have your money, still have your joy. Still have a good life, still have a good family. We listened to something recently about Pastor Marston. I was, I was riding. I was listening to a uh, podcast about integrity. Let's see if I can. Th- and I wrote a couple things down. Oh, boy. I, I, I wrote a couple things. Yeah, where the money resides, right there. Okay. Yeah. I can't find it right now. Um, but it was talking about how just one little decision to do the wrong thing can totally unravel your life. We were listening to someone this morning come in, DeForest De Soros, who we've had preach for us. He, every Sunday morning, he's on Urban View. He was talking about how their people, 30 years later, still paying the price, the consequences of one little decision. It didn't seem like it was that big at the moment. But it unravels. And it doesn't mean that God doesn't forgive you. But it means it can short circuit the blessing that maketh rich and have no sorrow that's on your life. I want to finish strong. Oh, glory. I want to finish strong. Glory to God. I'm, glory to God. I, when, when, when I was younger, I would just say, Lord, help me not to chase women. Thank God I don't have to pray that prayer no more. I couldn't catch him anyway. <laughs> the Bible says, flee, flee you for us. But if you get old enough, the you for us will flee you. <laughs> Some things you got to outlive and grow up and become mature. But certain things you got to just make up your mind about. I don't know why I'm stuck right here right now. I hear people say this kind of thing. Well, man, if I was in that same situation, I don't know what I would do. We got a problem. Your mind already already be made up what you're going to do. Some of y'all didn't catch that. That's integrity. Make up your mind. No, no. Uh, if I was in, first of all, I say, no, I, I'm, I, I would do my best, first of all, not to be in that situation. I want the blessing. Come on, stand up. I'm done. We already take communion, so I can just keep talking. How many of y'all want the blessing on your life? Yeah, I want it on my life. I don't want it on my season. Mm. I don't want it on this stage of my life. I want it on my life. I want to see it in my home, in my church, in my family, in my finances, in my body. Went to, had a, just a follow up point with Dr. Daniels. The other day, and he, he, he being so nice because I'm his pastor and bishop. And he said, so bishop, how we, how, how we been doing on the, uh, on the uh, lifestyle changes? <laughs> no, he wasn't say, you've been exercising, but he, he trying to be nice. He said, yeah, well, let me see, what was your weight when we came in? Oh, don't worry about that. Then said, you know, you know, the best, you know, the main area you gotta be concerned about is, you know, just I'm like, yeah. We gotta make up our minds how long we want to live. What we gonna do? And and let me say this from a health perspective. Catch this. I know young people, it's hard to realize this. What you do or don't do in your 30s and your 40s, you're gonna start paying for it in your 50s and your 60s. Amen. I'm telling you. I know it seems like, yeah. What you do or don't do in your thirties or 40s, you're going to, pay, going to pay the price in your 50s or 60s. So stop waiting 
Later on, no, no, no. I want the blessing of my life. I want my life to be blessed. I want my life to be blessed. I want my life to be blessed. That's every spirit, soul, body, finances, family, everything. I want to have God's best. I want God's best. When God gives us his instructions, he, he's not doing this because he said, I don't want you having sex with multiple people because I don't want you having all that pleasure. Maybe he was saying, I don't want you having mo monkeypox. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, I don't know what man needs. And now everything and everybody's supposed to try to make unsafe stuff safe. We can't come up with pills to make unsafe stuff safe. These, com these commercials are deceiving you. Don't change your lifestyle. Just take this pill and keep on going. You're a fool. I want God's bless on my life. My life. And Jesus Christ came and died that every area of your life can be made better. I'm so glad I found that out because I came a long time. They just said everything was about heaven. When I, was, I was reading that scripture. I, I was teaching about a couple weeks ago. We don't teach about gluttony. Mm, boy, we all just got quiet. And you better not start teaching about it today, Bishop. <laughs> but I was reading the scripture the other day. It was talking about gluttony and adultery. No, gluttony and the drunkard. That, that's what it said. It said gluttony and a drunkard going to come to poverty. We, we know about being drunk. Who deals with overeating? That's in the word. And it's not because it's going to send us to hell. It's because it's going to cause our life not to be blessed. So let's just make up our minds, y'all. I want the blessing on my life, and I want to do it God's way. Somebody say, I'm going to do it God's way. Do it God's way. Now, for some of y'all, us, us, not y'all, us, it's going to take some discipline. It's going to take some. This, I think Pastor Marshall got up. This morning was exercising. I'm like, what you doing? <laughs> it's Sunday morning. What you need? I need exercise on. It's a Sabbath. <laughs> Making all this noise, exercising too. Hear this breathing hard. Hear machines going. What you doing? <laughs> she just made up her mind. She's gonna be disciplined. Come and raise your hands to the Lord. Let me pray over you. I don't know what I'm gonna pray, but I'm gonna pray. Father, help us. Bless us with the blessing. Father, thank you for your word today, that your word is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. I declare in the name of Jesus, everyone under the sound of my voice, make up our minds that we're going to do things God's way, that we can tap into the blessing. Father, there are people here, I, I know the devil right now is trying to get off track trying to derail them from their destiny but I ask in the name of Jesus that they would have the mind and the determination to stick with it, to push through to push through offense to push through unforgiveness to get back in the place that they know they should be with you and with the church I declare in the name of Jesus that, the, that your word opens up our understanding things that we didn't understand before things that we didn't take seriously before help us to be sober minded to be vigilant because the devil as a roaring lion is seeking whom he may devour. But I ask in the name of Jesus, Father, that you help us to put on the whole arm of God, to have, that, to have on the helmet of salvation, to, to have on the, the, the breastplate of righteousness, the girdle buckled about with truth of your righteousness, our, our feet shall with the preparation of the gospel of peace, taking the shield of the spirit and the, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. I declare in the name of Jesus that we stand, that we stand against every deception of the devil, that we see the devil afar off, that we make wise decisions today that's going to positively affect our lives tomorrow. I declare the blessing of the Lord that maketh rich and add of no sorrow in the every area of our lives, that the hand of God shows up 
that other people will say and see that we are the people whom the Lord is blessed and other people testify the Lord has done great things for them in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus God help us not to get off track by what we see on social media and be so concerned about who's following us that we stop following you let your word be a lamp unto our feet light into our path and let us hide it in our hearts so we won't sin against you in Jesus name amen come on if you receive that give God praise for it